Could I ask you to take your Bibles? I hope you have them. Or your phone, your app. And would you find the New Testament book of 1 Thessalonians? Let me ask you to take your Bible, and even at home, to have a Bible open or to have a copy of God's Word. 1 Thessalonians is where we are today, and we're going to talk for the next few moments about modeling the right stuff. Modeling the right stuff. This is a reference to the church that was located in Thessalonica. So my, my perception today is that most of us gathered or online, we know things about North Little Rock, or maybe we know things about Little Rock, or Fayetteville, or Hot Springs, or some of these other places. We, we know things about our state and the communities around us, but I, I don't know how much we really know about Thessalonica. I want to give you just a little background, and then we're going to read several verses today from the first chapter. So the situation, the context of this letter, to a church that was located in the city of Thessalonica. This is part of the second missionary journey of Paul. He had first missionary journey, second missionary journey, third missionary journey. In this second missionary journey, Paul is writing to this church that he knows and has visited in Thessalonica. He is not in Thessalonica. He is probably in Corinth writing this letter about 50 A.D. So if you like facts, I just gave you a number of those real quick, okay? 50 A.D., Paul's the writer, writing to a church, and he knows this church, he loves this church, and he's writing a letter to them. Now, Thessalonica, let's talk about that for a moment. I just kind of like to say the word, Thessalonica, uh, a city of first century world, you were to research it, and you may know this already, but it was a metropolis. It wasn't a small dot on the map. It had many people. Some say up to 200,000 people uh, resided in this city called Thessalonica. And here's an interesting thing to note. When you think about this ancient city, it was located on a major highway, a super highway, if you will, of that day, the Via Ignatia. It's where people would travel down the highway from east to west, west to east. And here's an interesting note. It went right through the city of Thessalonica. So all these people, all this commerce, all these nations traveled in that world through the city of Thessalonica. It's an important city. So we read a letter. There's 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, but in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, read with me today just where you are, your translation, follow along, read it quietly, and we're going to look in verses 4 through 10. I'm so glad we have our Bibles, <laughs> and I'm glad we can open today and read God's timeless Word. So verse 4 says, For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that He has chosen you. Because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with joy given by the Holy Spirit. Verse 7, and so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and the true God and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom you raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. A number of years ago when I 
pastored in Searcy, Arkansas. There was a young man that came to church one day. He was a student from Harding University. And we just happened to cross paths, and I showed him to a small group that he could be a part of. And as we were walking from one place to the other, first-time visitor, he asked a great question. In fact, it's a question that kind of threw me a little bit. I was a little surprised by the question. So do you want to know the question? The question this 20-something asked me is basically, so what is your church all about? First time, never been here before, hey preacher, so what is your church all about? That's a good question. What would you say if someone came to you and said in similar words, hey, what is Park Hill Baptist Church all about? How would you answer that question? The church we're looking at in Thessalonica was a church that modeled, do you catch that word? It modeled the right things. It was a good example. It was the right pattern. If you were to say, well, this is a church that you should imitate or copy or practice like this church, this would have been one of those churches. And Paul compliments them by saying, you are a model church. You're doing it right. You're on target. You're living the faith. You believe in the gospel. You're you're making a difference. So he said about the church back then, but I want to think about that in the context of our world today. What should we demonstrate as a church? What should we be known for? Now, there's a whole list, lots of things we could say. I won't cover it all, but I'm going to mention three. And the first of these is celebration. What should a church that's doing it right model? And I will use the word celebration. Now, we see examples of celebration all the time. We see them at the beginning and the end of life when a new baby is born, a boy or girl comes into the family. It can cause tears. It's an emotional moment. It is quite dramatic in many ways to see the beginning of life. And then also at the end of life, when a person has lived their life, maybe for 80 or 90 or 100 years, and you come to the last of their life, and they take their last breath, and you gather for a funeral, people will come, and they will remember that person that has died. Many times, uh, frankly, I, I've just seen tears. A baby's born, there's tears of joy. Someone you love and your family dies, there's tears of sorrow. And yet, I've seen at the end of life how sometimes people are celebrated. They are given tribute or heartfelt comments are made in the, uh, the service of a, of a funeral. And I would say that whether it's young or old, that is example of celebrations that we know in our life. Now, I could spend a long time, but that's not really the purpose of what I need to say in the next moment here. But I am going to put it in. I, I am going to say that we celebrate when the Razorbacks win nine basketball games in a row. <laughs> you know, I could talk sports a long time, but I don't need to do that. <laughs> But when, it, when things kind of go on a, a nice, you know, every once in a while you, you win nine in basketball and win your first six in, in baseball and the women's team plays and then top 20 and, you know, you got track and field. That does, and when it all comes together, it kind of puts a smile on your face. And if you're a Razorback fan, or you got to smile a little bit and celebrate those kind of times. I thought that was very nice because I know we have dear family and guests that are here from Alabama today. (laughs) Well, I need to push on because I'm already in trouble. But isn't there celebration? I mean, I don't know. You follow this maybe. I do some. Coach Musselman, I mean, if you, you watch him in the locker room after a game, it's like total celebration. I better not go much further than that. But But they're happy, and they celebrate. 
And then celebration. We're talking about that key word for a church. How about celebration when you think about being you know, 17 or 18 years old and you receive a letter saying you are admitted to the university of and you receive that acceptance letter. I don't know, that's a special moment. We celebrate that. That's happy excitement in our life. Well, if we uh, celebrate, celebrate those things, I want to say today that we as God's people must celebrate, should celebrate. If anybody knows how to celebrate, it should be us, God's people. God's given us something to be joyful about, something to celebrate. And a church that's doing it right is a church that celebrates life, Jesus' life, in the midst of the people. Celebration. It's been a hard year. I'm not going into that subject for a long time. But it doesn't mean we can't celebrate Celebration is part of the marking of God's church and His people. You say, well, Ken, what do we celebrate? And we could talk for a long time about that. I didn't get this out of a book. I just wrote down some things that we celebrate as a church, as a people of God. We celebrate the greatness of God. The greatness of God. We celebrate the power of the Scripture. We celebrate the truth of the gospel. We celebrate the promises of the book. We celebrate the reality that we have a perfect Savior who didn't sin one time. We celebrate a perfect Savior. We celebrate a life-changing cross, death to life. We celebrate the fact that the tomb is open and the Savior, Jesus, is risen We celebrate that Jesus is King of all kings and Lord of all lords. We celebrate the promise of His return. We celebrate a lot. We celebrate the importance of the local church. We need the church. We need each other. We need the community of people that know Jesus coming together on a regular basis. We celebrate the power of being part of a loving, caring, gospel-centered Bible-believing church, we believe in the local church. We celebrate that. When you think about celebration, we think, we think about the message that we get to share, and the message is one of hope. I'm always going to say that. The message of the gospel is good news. It is hope. We celebrate. We have a message to share that brings hope. We celebrate that one day there's the anticipation of heaven and much more. But if that doesn't make you happy, it should, because that's what we know and what we do as God's people. We celebrate. There is, in my understanding, uh, what is called Mobius syndrome. And people that have Mobius syndrome are not able to move their facial muscles, they can't smile. Even if they wanted to, they can't smile. It doesn't happen. When I think about the church, when I think about you, when I think about the church from Paul's day all through the centuries, imperfect as it has been, I know that the core of who we are in Christ is worth celebrating. And today I hope that you can smile. I hope that you can smile from the inside out. I hope that you can smile when you think about what Jesus means to you, how he changes us. We are a people that celebrate. A model church celebrates. We don't want to be a dead church, a boring church, a lifeless church. We want to be a church that has a living relationship and reality with Jesus Christ. And because of that, we can now celebrate. Celebrate. So Park Hill, let's celebrate. Let's celebrate. Second thing, as he talked about a model church, verse 7, he said they not only had a celebration of life in Jesus, but there's also the understanding that they had, I'll put the word touch. The church touched others, cared for others. They reached out. You could call it many things, missions, ministry, evangelism, 
But what is found in this church is that they had a reach, not only to a few, but to many. And they reached out to their world. They shared a Christ-like touch in the first century world. Now let them preach. Because we're supposed to touch and care and reach out to neighbors and to nations. The church has a mission to say for those close to it, there is care. And for those that are far away, there is care. There is a touch both to neighbors and to nations. Remember that I said that this was a church that was located on a super highway. So I know, just kind of think about this in your mind. Think about being on a major place on the map and people that would come from east to west, west to east, and they would travel through your city. And Thessalonica had a church that Paul had been a part of, and he says, you are in a place where you can reach the world. You can touch the lives of people where you are and as they travel through. And then I got to thinking about this, you know, as you process and you think about it, and I I, I just want to share this, Park Hill. I want to remind us where we sit. 201 East C Avenue. But within a mile of where you are today, if you're here, in this church building, there is a major hub of Interstate 40 and 30. So people travel from coast to coast, and they come just a mile away. They come right by, right by this church building, right by North Little Rock, going from Memphis to Fort Smith. They travel right by here. They go from here to Dallas, down I-30. They, they travel in this hub where we are right now. You see the connection? Like sitting at a major place, you have the gospel to share, and now the opportunity to reach out, to touch, to share, to care for people that travel through your city and live in your neighborhoods. And then I thought about just getting real, it's like those maps where you can zoom out, where you can zoom in. Apparently, I'm the only one that does that. (laughs) You know, zoom out, zoom in. But if you zoom in, just a block away from where we are today is John F. Kennedy Boulevard. How many thousands of people come by this area every week? Paul said you're a model church. You celebrate the joy and the life of Christ, and you also reach out and touch people around you, and further than you can even imagine, your impact goes everywhere, he says. This is a church that's doing it right. We can learn from this church. This is something we should remember, that there are people that need the care of Park Hill Baptist Church. And I love that word, care. Because it doesn't matter what age you are, everyone wants to know that someone cares about them. That's a quote that's, I think, attributed to President Roosevelt from years ago. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Do we as a church, 21st century version, model caring? And I have to say, as I think about Park Hill and what I know, what I've seen over the years, I think that there are some of the most caring people in the world in this church. I I don't see you as cold or callous. I see this church here, collect it, those online. I see Park Hill as part of the nature of a caring church. It's been that way for decades. People that care. And if we do that, we do it right, and it makes a difference. Paul reminded them there are people that need to know that they are cared for. You see, the emphasis is never on a building. I love the buildings, the property, the campus that is here, but the church is not the buildings, right? The church is the people of God, and God wants to use you and me and us so that we care for our community and for people that come and go through this area that they receive gospel touches from Christ. 
What kind of people are in the world today that might need care? Broken people. Lonely people. Difficult people. Confused people. Highly educated people. People that live in your neighborhood. People that sometimes have rough edges. I'm just reminding myself as I preach today, as hard as this is, that caring for others means that you sometimes, it's not always easy, but it's always right. Let's be a church that cares deeply with the heart and the voice and the actions of Christ. In fact, uh, when you read the Gospels, that's the way it is. I mean, Jesus was caring. He reached out to little children. He touched people that had disease. He went to his own 12 disciples. He taught them, spent time with them. He cared about them. He talked and cared about people that were pushed out from mainstream and marginalized. Jesus showed care and touch and interest in the people. A church that really does it right, is interested in the brokenness and the need of humanity. We celebrate and that puts a smile on our face. We care and touch and that moves our heart to be in sync with what Jesus taught us to be and to do. So I want to go back and, uh, man, I like all kinds of music from old to new. I mean, I'm not in that war. It's not what it's about. I'm not here to get into any of that. Please don't hear that. But I, an old song, an old hymn from a man uh, that lived back in 1871 to 1966. He was an evangelist, Charles Weigel. He was a songwriter. And I read this and studied this a little bit this week that he is the one that is the author behind the hymn, No One Ever Cared for Me Like Jesus. Do you know the circumstances of that hymn? He was an evangelist and he did his thing and he came one day back home and his wife said, I've had enough of being an evangelist wife and this ministry and I'm, I'm leaving you. And it broke his heart. And for a while, he was very despondent, even contemplated suicide, but knew that God had a mission for him and that his life was dedicated to sharing the gospel. And so, in his Florida home, he sat down at a piano one day and he wrote the hymn, No One Ever Cared for Me Like Jesus, in 20 minutes. Never ever had that experience again, but he wrote it in a short period of time and carried it all around the world to tell people that God cares for them. Now, I could clear the house real quick if I started singing. But these words are timeless. I would love to tell you what I think of Jesus. Since I found in him a friend so strong and true, I would tell you how he changed my life completely. He did something that no other friend could do. All my life was full of sin when Jesus found me. All my heart was full of misery and woe. Jesus placed his strong and loving arms around me, and he led me in the way that I ought to go. Every day he comes to me with new assurance. More and more I understand the word of love. But I've never, I'll never know just why he came to save me till someday I see his blessed face above. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. 
There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. A church that does it right cares. Final point. Celebration, touch or care, if you will. And then of this church and noticing its example, there is the the wording difference makers. They made a difference with their life. It says in verse 8 that from the church in Thessalonica, that the Lord's message, I love this expression, rang out. Like, rang out. Which means, it's kind of like a handbell, a brass instrument. You hear it, and you continue to hear it. It stretches out further and further and further. And so Paul is saying, as I look at your church and as I think of you and as I write this letter to you I remember that the message of the Lord rings out among you to the nations Macedonia and Achaia study it on a map sometime get your maps out in the back of the Bible you know the back of the Bible the maps now they're not inspired (laughs) that's a different subject they're just maps but they give you a tool to understand the world in which we're talking about. And and the maps show us of regions in Greece, in that area, Macedonia, Achaia, and through there are cities that this church influenced and impacted. They made a difference in their day. Difference-making. Rodney Stark is a sociologist. He's written a book called The Rise of Christianity. And in that, he asks a question, how and why did the church grow so fast? How did the Christian church grow so fast? And then he wrote this, for Christianity to have reached its size, it had to grow 40% a decade in the first three centuries. Think about that. The rapid expanse of the church from Jerusalem to the Roman Empire, it had to expand and grow in a multitude of ways and directions. And then Stark asks the question, and then he answers the question. He says, this is what carried the gospel forward into the Roman Empire. Quote, early disciples of Jesus were more compassionate than others around them. Then I love this. They outloved others. They outserved others. How does a church make a difference? It loves and serves, it serves and loves to the glory of God. Now, I lived a few years in Montana. As a high school senior, I was there in southwestern Montana. There are three rivers that come together, the Jefferson, Madison, Gatlin, and they come together, they merge together, they form the headwaters of the Missouri River. And that river, starting from that place in Montana, travels through the Dakotas and down through Nebraska and Kansas and across Missouri, 2,341 miles, the Missouri River. Three things come together, and the longest river in our nation, the fourth largest in the world, the Missouri River, 2,341 miles, comes together to form something mighty. We as a church, if we say we want to model celebration and care, and we want to reach out with difference-making, God can use this church. No doubt about it. God has, wants to present, and wants to in the future use Park Hill Baptist Church to His glory and to the fact that people come to know Jesus and are baptized. A model church.